Well, hello, FBC. Uh, here we are back in my home office again. I'm sorry that we can't be together in person like we have been for the last several weeks, but uh, uh, this does seem like the safest thing for us to do, especially since I myself am in quarantine. So you really don't want to be around me anyway. And um, so in the absence of that, uh, let's rejoice in the fact that the Lord has given us the ability to come together like this, um, even if it's not in person, we still have the opportunity to share together in God's word. And that's what we're gonna do next. We're going to go to God's word, which uh, I think is going to be very helpful for us as we think about um, walking with him through, uh, through this crazy season that we're in. Well, uh, speaking of crazy season, I, I was trying to decide if this season has been long enough yet that we can start laughing about things. And um, I, no, it, it has not been. Uh, and I, I am, I'm actually at the point that I'm kind of tired of this season and I'll wait till it's about five years behind me and then I'll start laughing about things. But I feel okay pointing out things that are just weird. And, um, and I was thinking about some of the weirdness that we encountered in the early days of this crisis, especially with some of the things that were suggested would cure us or, or prevent um, us from getting sick. And uh, let's start with one of my favorites, and that is that you can make hand sanitizer by mixing like rum and vodka, and that would prevent you from getting COVID. I suspect that hand sanitizer is not really what they had in mind. Um, and I don't know, I don't wanna judge, maybe, maybe that's something that uh, is very effective, but it just seems odd to me. But the strangest to me is cow urine. There are, there are companies that are, that are marketing products that the whole idea is that if you take in cow urine, it will prevent you from getting COVID or it will cure COVID. And so you can go online and find things like um, cow urine tablets. You can find cow urine soap and shampoo. And of course, if you really are courageous, you can find cow urine drinks. Now, we can kind of smile and say that's just weird and bizarre, but if you think about it, there are real dangers with false cures. See, the problem is the cures themselves sometimes can cause harms, can, can cause harm. Um, and worse maybe than any of that is that the cure can give false hope. The cure can lead someone to believe that they are cured or they are invulnerable when in fact, they could be in dire, dire situations. And I wanna to suggest to you that the same thing happens in our spiritual life. The same thing happens with the gospel. We have a lot of people in this world that are putting out what amounts to a false cure. And it's important to recognize this and to address it. And Romans 10, 14 through 21 is going to give us an opportunity to do that. Now, that's not the main point of his passage, but it's a clear implication of the passage. What Paul is doing in this passage is continuing to address the issue that he's been addressing um, for a little bit now. And that's the question of if Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is the Savior promised to the Jews for centuries, why do they reject him? And in fact, you can see how that very issue could, could undercut someone's confidence in Jesus. If this is the person that they've been expecting and waiting for, why didn't they receive him? And so Paul has been going through and addressing issues of why it is that Israel rejected Jesus. And he continues that today. And he's going to look at a couple of possible excuses, if you want to use that word, or reasons that uh, Israel may not have accepted the gospel. And the way he's going to do that is first he's going to set up, these are the conditions that have to be in place if the gospel is going to be believed. And then he's going to say, these conditions were in fact in place. And so 
Israel's reasons for not accepting the gospel don't have to do with these excuses. It has to do with something else. It has to do with the heart. So we're going to look at that today, Romans chapter 10, starting verse 14. And we're going to start by looking at the conditions of belief that Paul sets up, that he's going to ultimately argue these conditions, in fact, are in place for Israel. These are fairly familiar verses to you if you've grown up in the church, but let's take a look at them. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Well, again, if you grew up in the church, um, especially verses 14 and 15 are probably going to be somewhat familiar to you because this is where Paul kind of outlines a domino effect of events that have to happen for someone to put their faith in the gospel. And, and he starts at the end, the last domino effect, and in fact, and then he works his way to the first one. And the last one, the very thing that he hopes to happen is that people would call on the Lord. Now, this idea of calling on the Lord is, is to cry out, it's to summon, it's to, it's, it's to reach out for someone to help. Well, you can't reach out to someone to help if you don't believe that they are there, if you don't believe they are capable of helping, if you don't believe they're willing to help. You won't, you won't make a summons to them, you won't call out to them, and that's Paul's point here. If, if they don't believe, if they don't have confidence that God wants to help them and that God is able to help them, then they're not going to call out. If they don't, they can't, bo- they can't call out for help from the gospel if they don't believe the gospel is true. And how can they be- believe the gospel of true- is true if they've never heard the gospel? Right? If no one has ever told them, these are the facts of reality, the facts of reality are God's love for you, his desire to be in relationship with you. You're separated from him by your sin. Jesus' perfect life, death on the cross, resurrection, paved the way for that to happen. And you can enter into relationship and new life with him because of that. If they've never heard that to even consider if it's true, there's no way for them to believe it. And of course, how are they going to hear it unless someone comes along and actually declares it to them? And who is going to declare it to them? if no one has actually been sent with the assignment to do so. So that's the domino effect. Let's look at that domino in reverse order, kind of the experience that most people would have with it. And and you can see how it would work. It starts with sending. Someone is sent to preach the gospel. The gospel is then preached and someone hears it. When someone hears it, they have the opportunity to believe. And when they believe, they will call out to the Lord saying, save me from this situation that I am in. Save me from my separation from you, my separation from um, who I was meant to be and how I was meant to function. So that's what Paul is saying here. And and what he's going to do is he's now going to start easing into the point that, in fact, all of this is in place for Israel. And that's where he goes in verse 16. So these things are here, but the issue is they have not obeyed the gospel. Now, that's a weird word. We would expect him to say they did not believe the gospel. Why does he say obey? Well, the word obey here means to put yourself under the authority of someone. So they've not put themselves under the authority of the gospel. So we're not talking about simply an intellectual response. What's required is an actual kind of orienting yourself for, um, for who's in charge and, uh, and will they submit to the gospel? And Paul says, that's the problem. They haven't done that. And he says, even Isaiah predicted this, where Isaiah said that they, they were not going to believe. They have heard, but they were not going to believe. And this is going to be the very issue that Paul picks up next. And then Paul summarizes um, all of this in verse 17 by saying that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So what has to happen, someone has to take the word of Christ, present the gospel, present that word to them so that the Holy Spirit can work and they would have that conviction in their heart that these things are true and they would have faith and call out on the Lord. So that's where, um, that's where Paul is going. 
That's, or that's what Paul is saying. These are the conditions. And remember that Paul is setting all of this up in order to say, well, Israel hasn't believed, so what conditions haven't been met? And he's going to say, well, none of them uh, were, were failed to be put in place. They were all met. There's something else going on. Let's read the rest of the passage, and then we'll come back and look at the three different obstacles that Paul talks about. One is the obstacle of maybe they never heard the message. Second is maybe they heard it but didn't understand it. And the third is maybe there's a heart issue. So starting in verse 18, we see Paul say, But I ask, have they not heard? There's your objection. Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. But I asked, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and a contrary people. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at the different obstacles that Paul raises. And the first one is maybe they never actually heard the message. And, and Paul has an emphatic answer to that. Indeed, they have heard the message. And he actually uses the words here from Psalms to explain why that is the case. For their voice, the voice of those who preach, has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. Now, Paul knows fully well that not every single person on planet earth at that point had heard the gospel. It's still not true today. He's using the poetic language of the Psalms to bring out the fact that, look, God has, has taken his word and he has spread it and he has spread it throughout certainly the nation of Israel. So they don't have basis upon which to say that they have not heard. God has taken care of that. The second objection is, well, maybe they heard, but they didn't comprehend it. They, they just didn't get it. And Paul answers by quoting first Moses and then Isaiah. And both quotes essentially are saying the same thing, but from a slightly different angle. Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. Well, who's the not a nation? It's the Gentiles. And so what, what God is saying through Moses and Paul is pointing back to is, God has said all along that there are going to be people that don't accept him, and he's going to go to the Gentiles, and he's going to raise them up, and they will accept God. They will, they will receive that. And then Isaiah takes it a step further and says that these people who will accept that, these Gentiles, they weren't even looking for it. Now, why is this an answer to the question? Because Paul's point is that Israel had the scriptures. They were in a special covenant relationship with God. And yet, they would not receive, they would not accept what even these Gentiles who did not have the scriptures, who did not have that special relationship with God, even they understood it. They got it. So clearly, there is something else going on here. And what I'd like to suggest, and I think we've all experienced this, there are times when people are willfully ignorant. They are willfully not understanding something. Right. Two examples come to my mind right away. I have uh, a longtime friend of mine in Oregon. Um, uh, we're not super close, so I don't know fully how the story has unfolded, but I know at one point she was diagnosed with a very serious disease. And I had a chance to talk to her briefly uh, shortly after the diagnosis, and um, as well as some of her family members separately. And it was interesting to me because the family members were very frustrated that she simply would not believe that this diagnosis was true. She told me that herself. And um, despite the fact that she went after, she kept going from one physician to the next, to the next, trying to find someone to tell her something else, but every single one of them agreed, you have this condition. 
the, the tests on this are conclusive. This is true of you. But she absolutely would not accept what was right in front of her as being true. There was, a, there was an understandable, I mean, we sympathize with her, an understandable lack of, of, of understanding and acceptance of the truth that was right in front of her. But there's also a sense in which it was willful. I experienced that very issue with the gospel in a powerful way when I was in college. Um, I took a class at a, went to a secular university. I took a class called the philosophy of Christian thought. And it turns out it was taught by um, a very, very preeminent philosopher in the world who was also a Christian. And as the way things went at that school, when you see a course like that, most of the people go there thinking that this is going to be a class on why Christians are dumb. And um, that's what most of the people thought this class was. And yet this professor brilliantly laid out the case for Christ and the case for belief in God. Yet every single person that walked into that class as an atheist walked out of that class as an atheist at the end of the course. They could not refute him. He actually dedicated two entire class sessions just for people to ask questions and point holes in it. So about three hours worth of class time. And no one could touch what he had said, what he laid out. And yet every single person that walked in there an atheist walked out of there an atheist. Well, why? Because they had set in their heart the conclusion that they knew was true. And despite the evidence that was in front of them, their heart was not going to be shifted. And that's exactly what Paul is saying has gone on with Israel. The, the information, the truth was set in front of them, but they just would not accept it. And that's really what he's getting at when he concludes the passage with verse 21. But of Israel, he says, all day long. In other words, he has waited patiently. And in and, and waiting patiently, he's held out his hands. This is, this is an, in, an invitation, a calling himself. It's, it's he himself is calling out to them and waiting and waiting. Will you please come? But what has their response been? Again, this word disobedient. They would not submit to the gospel. But this other word is really telling. Contrary. The idea in the Greek word is that they were set against the gospel. They were actively opposed to it. They had made up in their minds, they had decided in their hearts what they were going to believe even before the evidence came and the evidence did nothing to dissuade them. In fact, they actively opposed that evidence. As we think about um, our situation today, the reality is that is very much around us in our culture. We are surrounded by people who hear the message, but resist it. And the problem is we as the church often respond to that by thinking that the problem is the message or the problem is the messenger. And what we need to do is alter the message. We need to change the message. We need to make it more marketable. We need to make it more acceptable and palatable. Not just understandable, we actually need to make it more acceptable to our culture. And what we end up doing is giving people a false gospel, a false cure the equivalent of mixing rum and vodka and saying, this is going to protect you from the spiritual dangers that are out there facing you. And so as we think about the principles that we take from this passage, I want to think about those principles from that perspective. And the first principle is this, the message is not the problem, right? So let's be really clear about what the message is. Let's make it very simple and very straightforward. And I broke it down into four parts. There are so many ways you can do this. I just broke it down into four parts as a way to get us talking. The first part of the message is God's love. God loves you so much that he pursues relationship with you. But the problem is separation. The, the reason that we are not experiencing that loving relationship with God is because our hearts are turned away from him. We have gone our own way. We, we do our own things. We have 
we have said to God's rightful rule in our lives that no, we disobey that. And even if it's not conscious that we're saying it to God, it is in fact what we are doing. But the third part of it is pursuit. God pursues us even though we are broken and he pursues us because he sent Jesus to live a perfect life, die on the cross to take the penalty for our sins. And he was raised three days later, both as the victory over death, but also to give us the power that we would have new life, a new life lived today, walking with God. And relationship is this, the door is open to have everything that you have ever done or will ever done forgiven and to have a life that is lived in relationship with God and becoming more and more like the person that Jesus was, Jesus is, in that incredible love that he has for you. Really what this is, is is a declaration of reality. Here's reality. The reality is you are loved. The reality is you are separated from God. The reality is God loves you so much, he pursued you, and Jesus loves you so much, he willingly participated in that plan. And the reality is that relationship with God is available to you right now that walks with you through life and lasts for all eternity. So the question is, how do you enter into that reality? And really, this is the message that Jesus gave. Repent, believe, and follow me. Acknowledge and turn away from those things that separate you from God. Have that conviction, that confidence to trust the four things we just said about reality, that you're loved, that you're separated, that you're pursued, and that you can have relationship. And then follow. Jesus' invitation was to follow him. Begin the journey to live as if it is true that you're becoming more like Jesus. You won't be perfect. You're not going to be close to perfect, but that doesn't change the reality that you're in relationship with God. And you just continue to move forward in becoming more like Jesus. That's the message. Now, there's nothing about that message that needs to be changed, updated, or made more acceptable. This is where we get into problems with offering false cures. People struggle thinking that the gospel isn't marketable. And so they they try to downplay some things and and mislead in other ways. And, And here's a core confusion that we have. We tend to think that the gospel fundamentally is an invitation to people. And so we try to make that invitation as appealing as possible so everyone will come. And that's not quite right for what the gospel is. The gospel is a declaration of what is true. And the Holy Spirit makes it possible for people to respond to that. And the question is, will you respond to what is in fact true? And if you understand the gospel that way, it helps you resist the temptation to emphasize benefits of the gospel that may never be promised and to skip costs of the gospel that we are told to count before we receive the gospel. The gospel is not an invitation. That's not the language Paul uses. It's a declaration of what is true. It's something that is proclaimed as clearly as possible. And then we trust the Holy Spirit to work. And that is what takes us to the second principle. The second principle is that our goal is to make sure that the gospel is clear. Paul writes this passage knowing that the gospel was clearly proclaimed to Israel. But I think it's fair, it's an important implication for us to step back and say, have we made the gospel clear? And there are some very common ways that we, and I'm leading the charge in this, I have been very guilty of not making the gospel clear. One of the first ways that the gospel is left unclear is is we leave out any reference to sin and repentance. And and we don't want to make people feel bad, but, but the problem is this removes any need for the cross. In fact, you can make it sound like the good news of Jesus, or the good news of Jesus is that God doesn't really care much about what you do. And that can sound very appealing if you think that the gospel is an invitation to invite someone in. But first, it's not reality. And second, it becomes incredibly poisonous when that person is in crisis 
And fundamentally what they believe about God is that God doesn't care about the details of their lives. The second way that we, we tend to try to market the gospel or muddy the gospel or replace the gospel with a, a false gospel is by leaving out any reference to actually following Jesus. Right? Sometimes we're honest that sin is a problem and, and we need to turn from it, but, but we treat it like that's a one-time event and, and, and that all Jesus is calling us to is just that one time say, I'm sorry, and then we don't really have to worry about following Jesus or any changes after that. And I'll be honest, I almost never hear a gospel presentation that includes following Jesus, except for from Jesus. And you look at the Gospels, and that is his constant refrain, follow me. See, what we are receiving is a life with God, where we abide with Christ and become more like him. And the problem is, if you think that the Gospel is an invitation that you market, you listen to that and you go, who has time to explain that? I've got three minutes standing on this person's porch. I've never met him before. I've got to go through this little booklet. Who in the world could ever talk about following Jesus in that point, at that point. And, and maybe the problem there, if that's how you're thinking, is that what you're really trying to do is market the gospel instead of make clear what reality is that people can then respond to. Third common way that we kind of produce a, a false cure spiritually is by making the gospel all about us. Right, you hear things like, if you accept Jesus, your life will get easier and more comfortable, your job situation will get better, your relationships will improve, and all of that. Um, here's another common version of this, and you'll hear this a lot. It's basically a form of, which do you want, hell or heaven? If you say this prayer, you'll go to heaven, and you don't have to worry about hell. Well, you know what? That's not a hard choice. And if that's all the gospel is, the problem is what we have just done is we've given them a bait and switch. Because then we invite them to church, and here's what they hear. They hear Jesus say, if anyone will be my disciple, they must take up their cross and follow me. And they feel like they were lied to. And I have seen the poison of that actually play out in the lobby of our church a few years ago, where a man said to me, this Christianity thing is not working out for me. I was told, and this is by the person who led him to Christ, that if I came to Christ, things would go so much better in my life. But nothing has improved in my marriage. Nothing has improved in my job. So I just don't think this Christianity thing is going to work out. And of course, there's the opposite extreme. And the opposite extreme is a way of, of offering a false gospel or a false cure by saying it's really all about your performance. And this is very common in our part of the world. It's the version of the gospel that says the good news of Jesus is that Jesus accepts good people. And, and everyone thinks that they are a good person. So again, there really isn't a whole lot of need for Jesus in this until they aren't a good person. And then they are left terrified that God must reject them because what they were led to believe is that what God cares about is that you do good things, say nice things, and you be a nice person. They have never heard that Jesus lived a perfect life. That got left out of the gospel presentation. They never heard that what we, they receive by putting their trust in Jesus, by believing in him, is that God now looks at them and sees the perfect life that Christ lives and it lived and gives them credit for that. That was left out of the gospel because they basically had the impression that it was up to them to be good and live on their own. Here's the danger. Here's the extreme danger. There are many people who hear these versions of the gospel that have never been saved, but they think they are. And I would suggest that churches around the world, and I'll be so bold as to say, especially in Bible Belt locations, are filled with people like that. They just keep going on thinking that they are fine because someone told them the equivalent of a rum and vodka hand sanitizer will, will protect them spiritually. Paul lays out for us, 
what has to happen if we're going to call someone, if someone is going to be saved. And he tells us that there are things that, that need, to, need to be done. We need to be sent. We need to proclaim. We need to proclaim it clearly, the word of Christ, the accurate word of Christ so that people hear the accurate word of Christ. And this may be something that takes place over time to truly explain the accurate word of Christ, maybe multiple conversations. And then people must in their heart say, this is true and it is is so true that it has changed my view of reality. We don't do that. That's not, not up to our marketing skills. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. And the natural response to someone believing that, being convinced that that is true, is that they will call out to the Lord. We need to guard against any temptation to think that the problem with the gospel is the message itself. It is not. See, the problem is, and this is Paul's point in this passage, is that disbelief is a heart issue. It's a heart problem. It is a heart issue that it will not submit to the truth of the gospel, and that in fact opposes the truth of the gospel. And the only way that you can solve a heart problem is through the work of the Holy Spirit, not through more creative marketing. So the implication for that is as we share the gospel and as we relate to the people around us, we always start with prayer. We must constantly be going, for, going before the Lord in prayer and ourselves calling out to him on behalf of the people that are around us. And we trust that the Holy Spirit can and will work in their hearts. And then we speak. We make the gospel as clear as possible. And we may have to do that over time in multiple conversations. And then we keep praying. We fall on our knees before the Lord and we take the person that we've been talking to before him. What are some ways that we can apply this and and the ways that I'm gonna suggest are consistent with what we just talked about? First, as we do each week, I encourage you to uh, rewrite the passage and that will help you uh, internalize this passage a little bit better and the implications of it. But I invite you to think of one person you know who does not know Christ and then ask a couple of diagnostic questions. Do you know if they have heard the gospel? Have they actually heard the clear gospel? Have they understood it? Uh, Or or has it been confused with so many different things, the promises of of a comfortable life here on earth or uh, just no reference whatsoever to the fact that there are things that they need to repent of? If, If we leave those things out, they have not understood the gospel. And then the last thing I would encourage you to do, and this is such a helpful exercise. Honestly, it was helpful for me in just even writing this sermon. It's just to go back and in your own way and how you would express it, what is the message of the gospel, right? And the way I've suggested is the message of the gospel is a declaration of reality. God loves you. We're separated from him. God pursues you with Christ and you are you have the door open for you to enter into relationship uh, with him. Well, how do you enter into that reality? How do you how do you embrace that reality? You repent, believe, and you follow Jesus. That's what Jesus said you do. Repent, believe, and follow him. So that's a very simple way that I would succinctly explain the gospel. But all of those points I would take time to explain with someone over time, over multiple conversations. Figure out for yourself, how would you do that? We have a Savior who loves us so much that he pursued us that we might be in relationship with the Heavenly Father. Let's go before the Lord and ask for his strength in making clear to those around us the wonderful message of the good news of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much that when we were separated from you, you pursued us. And Lord, we are reminded from this passage that you did everything, you have put everything in place that has opened the door for someone to enter reality. 
And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you did it for us. And we ask that you would do it for the people around us whom we love so much. And Lord, we even ask for the privilege of being a part of that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think what Paul would want us to understand about who God is from this passage is this. God did everything that is necessary so that you could call out to him. That is who our God is. That is how much he loves us. That is how far he will go. And even after you've entered into relationship with Christ, he continues to love you just as much. How do we not want to share this message with others? And that's our challenge as we leave here, right? The passage says that we will not proclaim unless someone has sent, but what does Paul also call us? We are, we are ambassadors of Christ. That means people who are sent. You are sent. So leave today knowing, confident in God's deep love and pursuit for you, but also knowing and confident that you have been sent to share it with others. I hope you have a wonderful day. Please stay safe. And uh, again, if there's anything that you need, even though the staff is going to be uh, not at the office as much over the next week or two, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are responding. We're connecting with people. We're doing what we can to support people. So uh, look forward to connecting with you this way next week.